So hello everyone and welcome to Fusion EP Talks, a student-led webinar platform for sharing knowledge about nuclear fusion science and engineering. I'm Katerina and I would like to introduce our speaker, Sam Gibson. She's a final year PhD student in the field of experimental plasma spectroscopy in the Fusion Center of a Doctoral Training Program with Durham University and Callum Center for Fusion Energy. Her research focuses uh, on the emotional Stark effect diagnostics, which is used to measure the structure of the magnetic field in tokamaks and the development of 2D imaging MSE diagnostics uh, for the mast of great tokamak. And Sam is also participating in a glass of water project, which is a podcast about nuclear fusion energy research in conversations between PhD researchers from the fusion and other experts. And they're really doing a great job. And I will post a, a link for this uh, podca podcast uh, in the chat. So uh, you will be able to take a look uh, later on. So without further delay, I give the floor to Sam. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I hope you find this informative. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, how we measure the current profile in uh, fusion tokamak plasmas. Um, so just to give you an outline of the talk, um, I will go over some basic plasma physics um, and the idea of a plasma equilibrium. Um, sort of more about why we wanted to be able to measure the current profile in a tokamak and why we need to do that accurately. Um, how we can measure the current profile um, and where spectroscopy could lend a hand in measuring the current profile in the core of a plasma. Um, a little bit about how we design and develop diagnostics um, in order to meet certain physics criteria, and then where the future of uh, spectroscopy will go for larger tokamaks such as ETA um, and some experiments on the jet tokamak. Um, so to start with, uh, as we know that in axisymmetric equilibria, um, the magnetic field lines lie in a nested toroidal magnetic surface. Uh, the condition for a plasma to be in equilibrium um, is that the forces on the plasma need to go to zero. Um, we need to balance the magnetic forces with uh, pressure gradient forces. Um, we know that current flows along flux surfaces, so we can introduce the idea of a current flux function, um, and we can rewrite our force balance equation in terms of a current flux function and a poloidal flux function and the pressure profile, and we can arrive to um, an equation called the Gradshvarnov equation, which describes the force balance in uh, plasma equilibrium. Um, this is a nonlinear partial differential equation, so it's quite difficult to solve analytically. Um, in tokamaks, what we tend to have is these very strongly shaped plasmas. We normally drive current externally using neutral beam systems or microwaves, um, and this can lead to fairly complex pressure profiles and current profiles with very steep gradients. Um, so in order for us to um, calculate our plasma equilibrium, we introduce the idea of a plasma equilibrium solver. Um, so the idea here is that we can use diagnostic measurements um, of say the pressure profile, the current profile, and the magnetic fields um, and the plasma boundary in order to calculate this pressure and current profile for a given flux function. Um, and we do this in an iterative approach by reducing the chi-squared between the expected and the measured values um, for the pressure and current, and also solving the Gretsch-Fraun equation simultaneously. Um, so you can see on the right here, we have a poloidal cross-section um, of a plasma on jet um, and a couple of the cords of some diagnostics, um, which make some measurements internally in the plasma um, can be viewed. Um, however, um, the quality of your plasma equilibrium depends quite strongly on the quality and also the quantity of um, the internal measurements provided to the equilibrium. Um, if you only provide the edge measurements around the edge of the plasma, you might be able to get a strong boundary solution, but um, they, they may lead to many possible solutions for the internal pressure and current profiles with the same boundary shape. Um, so later on, we'll be looking at some diagnostic measurements that we could use um, in, internally in the um, in the plasma to constrain the current profile. Um, so why do we actually want to measure um, the current profile in any case? Um, well, because we know that um, the internal current distribution tells us a lot about uh, what types of uh, plasma instabilities we might be accidentally driving or we might come across 
um, during a, a plasma scenario, which can degrade the performance. Um, for example, if we know the location of the rational Q surfaces um, or the rational safety factor, um, the safety factor in the um, in the plasma, um, then we might be able to avoid things like neoclassical tearing modes by being able to tailor the current profile. Um, and one particular example I'd like to give um, is uh, the edge localized mode. Um, so this is an instability which depends bo on both the uh, pressure gradient in the pedestal and also the current density in the pedestal. Now we can measure the pressure gradient very well. We can use the Thompson scattering um, diagnostic to do that. However, normally we would need to use a theoretical approach to calculate what the current is at the edge of the plasma. If we had a way of doing this uh, more directly, then this could lead to more informed stability analysis and maybe a better understanding of how to avoid ELMS altogether. Um, so how do we measure the internal current profile? Um, we have no way of really directly measuring the current profile, especially in the core of the plasma. Um, at the edge, we could use magnetic probes, but that's obviously infeasible when we think about um, the plasma core. Um, however, we can use spectroscopy. So this is a way of measuring light that's emitted by atoms inside the plasma. Um, and he will focus on neutral beam spectroscopy. So um, this is where we inject neutrals into the plasma um, for heating and current drive purposes. Um, these atoms, as they collide with the plasma, they emit radiation. Um, and due to the velocity, um, this emission then is Doppler shifted away from the main D alpha peak. So you can see the big passive um, D alpha peak at about 656 nanometers and um, emission from these these uh, fast moving neutrals is Doppler shifted away from the D alpha peak. And um, when I'm talking to you today, I'll talk about a specific transition in the Balmer series. So these are transitions between the N equals three and N equal two states in hydrogen. And this is a Balmer alpha transition. Uh, however, so we know in a top rack, um, these atoms are subjected to external magnetic fields. Um, as they move through, uh, as these neutral atoms are moving through the magnetic field, this generates a motional electric field in the rest frame of the atom. Um, and then this leads to stark splitting of the energy levels. Um, emission from these levels is polarized, um, parallel or perpendicular to this generated motional electric field. So you can see um, our line shape is now split into a multiplet. Um, and I will refer to the central component of the multiplet as a sigma transition and the two wings as uh, pi transitions. Additionally, um, in these neutral um, beam injector systems, there is a presence of not only deuterium, but um, molecular deuterium D2 and D3 molecules. Um, and these generate a half and a third energy component, um, um, which also emit in the same manner. Um, So if you imagine we have our Stark observer and they're looking perpendicular to this motional electric field, then these uh, sigma line transitions are linearly polarized uh, perpendicular to the electric field and the pi transitions are linearly polarized parallel to the electric field. So if we know the orientation of the emission with respect to this motional electric field um, and the electric field is perpendicular to the magnetic field, we can then infer the magnetic pitch angle in the plasma. Um, so we know that we want to measure the polarization of the light, which is emitted from these uh, neutral atoms. Um, we need to be able to preserve this information, uh, this polarization information. And we can do that either by using um, amplitude modulation, so we're turning um, the polarization information into an intensity modulation or phase modulation. So in the case of a conventional uh, MSE diagnostic, um, we convert the polarization information into an intensity modulation. And we do this using um, a crystal. So this is um, something like fused silica. Um, and we drive this crystal at a specific frequency. And this induces uh, stress-induced birefringence. Um, so I really like this video here. It's uh, um, a video where someone is um, has a piece of plastic and they're driving um, sort of like a frequency using a drill in the top of the plastic. And you can see the variation in the birefringence in the plastic as you're driving that frequency. And that's sort of equivalent to what's happening inside this um, crystal in order to convert this polarization information into an intensity modulation that we can measure. Um, 
and then um, we transmit this um, uh, light through optical fibers back down into the diagnostic cubicle where then we select either the, a pi or a sigma line using a very narrow band pass filter. So I wanted to give you a, a brief uh, history of the um, MSE diagnostic. Um, so the first measurements made with an MSE diagnostic was in around 1989 um, on the PBXM tokamak. And they had a single sight line, so this is just a single fiber. And then they would repeat the same plasma shot, but they would move the fiber very slightly to give a different location within the plasma. And then you can measure the pitch angle as a function of radius um, across the plasma. Um, and this was very successful. They managed to validate some of the theoretical models at the time about um, sawtooth crashes. Um, and now this diagnostic is effectively routine on almost all machines um, across, across the world. Um, we've had some very notable achievements with this diagnostic. Um, so one of the examples I've given here um, was the observation of a current hole around the magnetic axis in jet. Um, so you can see that the pitch angle sort of tends towards zero right across the magnetic axis in the core of the plasma. Um, and if your pitch angle is zero, this in indicates that the polar field also goes to zero. So you effectively have a hole of current in the center of your plasma. Um, and this is sort of a transient effect. This might actually go away, um, as you can see, um, a few hundreds of milliseconds later. Um, but this was a really exciting measurement that was made at JET. Um, additionally, on MAST, we've um, used the MSC diagnostic um, to try and directly measure the current profile to assist in the amp stability analysis, as I discussed earlier. Um, so recently, there's been also some um, developments of an imaging based approach to um, MSC. So this is based on the coherence imaging um, diagnostic um, works like a polarization interferometer. Um, so what we do is we use um, biofringent crystals to um, spatially modulate or encode the polarization information um, into an interferogram in an image. Um, and one of the um, benefits really of doing like imaging interferometry is having this 2D information available to us. Um, so you can see this was some data that we took with an imaging MSC diagnostic on the D3D tokamak. Um, and you should be able to see over time, um, as we switch the beam on, you start to get these interference fringes, which signify that we have some polarized emission um, in, in the tokamak. Um, and we are, it might look a bit strange because we're looking actually on the high field side of the machine. Normally these uh, diagnostics tend to look at the low field side, um, but you can see the edge boundary um, very well. Um, and I think the flashes line up um, somewhat with like, ELM activity, um, this is over um, the entire range of a, a plasma shot, so it's fairly likely. Um, but yeah, the advantages is having this 2D vertical information, and we wanted to see whether this would um, improve our equilibrium reconstruction if we're adding more measurements um, of the pitch angle um, into the equilibrium. Um, how, do we better constrain the current profile? Do we better constrain the pressure profiles? Um, so now you can see if I um, average down our 2D data into a 1D radial slice, um, you can see the imaging MSE measurements um, on the left hand side and then the conventional MSE measurements which go all the way out to the low field side and there's really nice consistency between the two diagnostics. Um, but we also see that even when we add in these imaging MSE points, which um, are consistent with the conventional MSE, we still get a change in the um, current profiles and the pressure profiles, which are um, output from the equilibrium reconstruction. Um, so obviously we can see that by adding additional data into the equilibrium, we're getting different pressure and current profiles. Um, so we've shown that by making measurements using these imaging MSE systems, um, we can have a significant effect on the um, equilibrium output. Um, but how do we actually design these diagnostics in order to make sure that we're measuring the current profile accurately? Um, there are actually a huge amount of considerations we need to make. Um, for example, the optical components that we use, ensuring that the view geometry is optimal um, to maximize our radial resolution. Um, can the camera run at the exposure times that we need uh, to accurately capture the physics we want to measure? 
um, what, how do we model the spectrum, um, the MSC spectrum? Um, there are lots and lots of things we need to um, consider. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit about a part of my PhD thesis where I included, um, I did some modeling and uh, design work for an imaging MSC diagnostic on mass subgrade. Um, this is really interesting because um, these low field spherical tokamaks like mass upgrade, um, the, um, we know that the, um, the stark splitting of the MSC spectrum is proportional to the magnetic field strength. So when we um, go to these low field um, magnetic, when we go to these low magnetic field regimes, um, the a level of stark splitting is very small. And actually our, our multiplet starts to, um, the broadening is significant and they start to overlap. And then this leads to a low polarization fraction. Um, this might mean that the signal to noise is not particularly good. Um, we need to think about ways that we can sort of um, overcome this low polarization fraction. Um, and by, do, by doing appropriate modeling of the spectral broadening effects, then we can really see what the impact of this broadening would be and what's the accuracy of the measurement that we could make. Um, so within this model, you can think about things like the divergence of the neutral beam. Um, so in an ideal world, you would say that the neutral beam was infinitesimally thin and your line of sight intersected with the neutral beam at one specific point and you measured one specific polarization angle. But in reality, that's not the case and we live in a 3D world. Um, so the emission that we're collecting is actually over a 3D volume across the neutral beam. So we're collecting a sort of average polarization angle over that volume. Um, and if, you're, if the um, polarization angle changes quite rapidly over that collection volume, um, then you might, then your uncertainty will be uh, much larger. Um, so we need to be able to model all of these 3D effects very well to get an accurate representation of the um, measured spectrum. And then we can accurately model the measurements that we're going to make with the system. So now we can see that by using modeling of the MSC spectrum, we could um, predict the capabilities of a diagnostic. Um, but in addition to um, the challenges that we might face on a low field device, if we think about moving towards these larger devices such as ETA, how are we going to have to adapt these spectroscopy diagnostics um, for the next generation of fusion devices? Um, there's some additional reading that I've posted here, which is by um, Anthony Donne. And he goes through some of the key issues for um, diagnostics and plasma experiments for ETA. Um, and it's a really good read if you're interested in the um, um, additional challenges we might face um, when we go towards ETA. So I will go through a few of them here as well. Um, so we're going to be working in um, a significantly harsher environment than we've had on any tokamak so far. Um, increased neutron levels. Um, and this can have a significant impact on um, components within spectroscopy diagnostics like mirrors and optical fibers and um, which degrade due to neutron irradiation. Um, we're also expecting these diagnostics um, to work on significantly longer pulse lengths and for um, even up to 30,000 shots on ETA. Um, currently these spectroscopy diagnostics we are maintaining, we're recalibrating after relatively short campaigns, maybe like three months, six months um, every year perhaps. Um, and we tend to require in situ calibration, so putting um, things like integrating spheres inside of the machine in order to fully calibrate systems attached to the tokamak. That's not going to be possible on ETA. So how often, we need to understand how often we will need to replace certain components, and whether it's possible to do um, routine calibrations um, on ETA. And if we take a look at the physics requirements that we would need, um, or the accuracy that we would need to meet the physics requirements for ETA. Um, so if we think about, we will need to be able to measure the Q profile to at least a 10% uncertainty and the position of these rational surfaces um, to within five centimeters. Um, is this actually going to be possible on ETA? Well, we know that this is currently possible on JET. Um, so what I'm showing you here is we have some, um, some of the MSC measurements that we made with the conventional system on JET, and then we can sample this data within the uncertainties um, of, the MSC of the MSC measurements, and we can run the equilibrium reconstruction many, many times 
um, by sampling the data. And this gives us a sort of range of possible Q profiles that we could have measured given the measurements that we actually made. Um, and so on the right, you can see we have two um, different Q profiles. So this is a time earlier and then later in the plasma. And we wanted to see whether there is a significant difference between the um, value of Q0 or the Q value at the magnetic axis. Um, so you can see that the, um, within the um, two sigma conf confidence interval, um, there is a distinct change in the, um, in the Q profile measured um, at the magnetic axis. Um, so we know we can do this on JET, but could we actually achieve the same accuracy on ETA? Well, there's even more additional challenges that we might face um, on ETA that would hinder us or at least um, increase the uncertainties that in the measurements that we would make using a conventional MSE system. Um, we're going to have to contend with long optical trains, um, such as what I'm showing here. So we have... Um, an example of what an MSE um, optical system might look like um, on the side of ETA. So we actually have four mirrors, I think, in this design. Um, and now polarization measurements and mirrors don't get on very well. Um, if, your, if the properties or the reflectivity properties of a mirror might change over time, particularly when you um, include um, plasma deposition on the mirror or on the first mirror, you might then see systematic changes or drifts in the measured polarization angle. Um, so on current systems, they sort of avoid this problem by doing routing calibration um, of the systems. But if that's not possible on ETA, that's going to be really difficult for us to um, be able to recalibrate out. Um, additionally, um, the um, ETA-like wall that we have on JET um, obviously is replicated of what they expect to have on ETA, so a tungsten-like wall. Um, if we start to have polarised reflection. So um, I've talked a little bit about um, some general challenges for spectroscopy on ETA. Um, and specifically, I'll look now at the challenges for MSE and to do with the neutral beam um, source. So for ETA, we're going to use a negative ion source. So this is slightly, this is actually a sort of posit positive for MSE. Um, as I said previously, we get in uh, the neutral beam sources for on like jet and mast, they use a positive ion source and we get these additional molecular um, D2 and D3 molecules, which make the spectrum a lot more complicated. We actually won't face that problem in ETA um, because the negative ion sources, you don't get these additional um, molec molecules or molecular deuterium. So we'll just get one nice clean spectrum, which is really nice. However, the ion source is going to be separated into different quadrants. So I think they're looking at having four different quadrants which would have slightly different tilt angles. So if you imagine that would be like having four um, sort of different neutral beams working with very different, um, slightly different um, beam velocity distributions. So at one position in the plasma, you'll be measuring um, effectively an average of the polarization angle over those um, uh, four electric, motional electric fields that you would be generating. Um, so in order to understand what the impact of this would be on the measurement, we really need to have a really good model of the neutral beam um, to know what the spectrum will look like and then look at what the polarization angle would be that we'd measure. So if we think we're going to have all these challenges when we think about polarimetry, is there another way that we could do this? Could we actually just use um, direct spectroscopy as an equilibrium constraint, for example? Um, so this is an idea which came about um, after discussing all of these problems with polarimetry for larger um, tokamaks. Um, and it's called like a, a line splitting MSE approach. So we know that the level of stark shift um, in the MSE uh, multiplet um, is proportional to the magnitude of the magnetic field. Um, so could we actually measure the spectrum and calculate what the stark wavelength shift is and convert that into the magnitude of the magnetic field at different locations in the plasma. Um, there's already been a lot of work um, of modeling this approach and its impact on equilibrium reconstruction. But having seen how um, sensitive your equilibrium pressure and current prof profiles are to adding additional um, measurements or removing additional me measurements, um, it's really important to know whether in practice this would actually work. Um, so we had one experiment, uh, one experimental pulse on jet 
where we tried to measure the MSC spectrum um, during some sawtooth cycles. So this is where the Q profile is hovering above and below one. So we know that in certain times, the spectrum that we measure should give us a Q profile or the equilibrium should give us a Q profile where the Q on axis is less than one and sometimes it should be above one. Um, so this is the spectrum that we had produced um, and uh, we're currently in, in the middle of, of sort of analyzing this data and fitting the spectrums to calculate the magnetic field. And then also you have to integrate this into the equilibrium reconstruction as an additional constraint. Um, you can't just um, substitute this in for polarimetry, for example. Um, so yeah, the, we're currently in the middle of, of this analysis. Um, and unfortunately, we only had one experimental pulse. Um, additionally, what we would really like to look at the influence of um, additional heating, such as ICRH on the spectrum, um, to know whether are we measuring, when we measure the MSE spectrum, are we measuring a variation in the pressure profile or are we measuring changes to the current profile? And that's a really key difference, which might make the difference between hitting those accuracy requirements for ETA or not. Okay, so um, I hope that I've showed you that the MSC diagnostic is a powerful tool for providing local measurements of the current profile. Um, and alternative polarimetry techniques such as imaging MSC are becoming much more well established um, and we're trying to prove that these can give you extra constraint for your equilibrium. Um, some of these polarimetry techniques, though, will be quite challenging on ETA. Um, and so testing these alternative um, spectroscopy techniques on JET will really give us some um, valuable information on what our Q-profile uncertainty will be for ETA. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you very much. And if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much. That's a really interesting topic and I'm glad to learn more about it. And now the floor is open for questions and maybe then I will start with the first question, uh, not really related to this talk, but uh, I would like to learn more about this uh, glass of uh, uh, water uh, project uh, that you have been participating. Yeah, um, so I didn't start the Glass of Sea Watch podcast, but um, there is a whole team of PhD students on the Fusion Centre for Doctoral Training who do an awful lot of editing and uh, coming up with ideas for podcasts. Um, so it's a Fusion based podcast where they try and go over some of the basics, solve some questions that people might have on different areas of fusion um, related to MCF or ICF materials, um, a whole bag of stuff. Um, and if you want to check it out, they have it on Apple um, podcasts and also on the Fusion CDT website. Um, they would all, always appreciate um, some listeners and yeah, I hope people enjoy it. <laughs> so now it's a good chance to ask something about uh, current measurements. Please let me know in the chat if you, uh, if you would like me to unmute you. And maybe in the meanwhile, uh, I could ask uh, what are your uh, future plans? Uh, and uh, are you planning to continue uh, with uh, this uh, work uh, or uh, are you um, going to do something different? I hope so. I have a postdoc lined up on mass upgrades. So um, I've spent a lot of time doing an awful lot of modeling work and waiting for mass upgrade to run. And now we'll finally get to see the fruits of the labor. Um, so I'll be working on mass upgrade, hopefully from next month or the month after. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question in the chat and somebody has that. Uh, yeah, up, that's so. right. Thank you. Uh, so um, I, will, I will try to unmute you. Um, so please so go ahead with your question. Yes, hi. Hi, this is Gonzalo. I'm, I'm connecting from Chile. So, so. Hola. So um, I, I just have a question for you. Uh, I couldn't follow um, in detail the, the experimental setup. So um, what type of uh, spectrometer are you going to use? Are you going to have a, um, uh, are you planning on having an imaging spectrometer or um, could you, could you uh, 
uh, go into a little bit more detail on that because I think I, I lost, uh, I, I was lost somewhere in there. Oh, is this on the, Im the imaging MSE diagnostic? No, uh, on the on the spectroscopy part because um, uh, uh, of the spectrometers because I know that you can have like um, uh, resolve uh, a stark uh, um, um, shift spectroscopy. So I wonder if you you were having that or you were just collecting all the light into one fiber optic and then putting it to the spectrometer. So I, I think I I got lost somewhere in there. Yeah, so with the, with the lines fitting MSE, you would have um, several different fibers looking at different locations within the plasma, and then you would measure, um, you would use like a, a wide filter around the wavelength that we're interested in. So for MSE, that's somewhere around 660 nanometers. Um, and then you would, um, so you can see on the right, I think if you can still see this plot. Um, so they've measured um, emission within 657 to 660 nanometers. And in purple, the purple line is the full energy MSE, fitted MSE multiplet. And then you have the second and the third energy components. And then usually they use like a blocking filter for the D alpha because sometimes that's so bright, it still might get through your filter and um, mess things up. Um, so yeah, the idea is to just measure this, the spectrum, the MSE spectrum, and then work out from the um, stark splitting what magnetic field that would correspond to given that we know what the velocity of the neutral beam atoms are um, if that mm -hmm. makes sense so yeah so uh, if i understood correctly so here you're using uh, the the neutral beam for this uh, uh, you are observing you are not observing the the deuterium alpha line because you are actually shifted isn't it so that's what I, I got lost. I'm I'm not I'm not an uh, um, ether uh, specialist or anything because I work in in a plasma focus discharges. So for me it's uh, somehow different. So that's why I'm I'm missing some of the the more details. Yeah, sorry. We're, well, yeah, we're not we're not measuring like the passive D alpha background. Um, mm -hmm. We're measuring um, the emission from the injected neutral um, neutral atoms. So um, with the neutral beam, they're firing additional atoms for heating and current drive and it's the um, emission from from those neutrals that we're measuring um, not the mm -hmm. like passive um, passive um, um, emission from the plasma okay okay great thank you and I see we have uh, another question uh, Sadiq Mulas please uh, go ahead uh, hi everyone thanks Sam for the for the nice talk um, I have a very, let's say, naive question, but uh, about the, the electric field that, the, that causes the Stark effect, is the neoclassical one or is somehow in, an, another imposed one or? Um, so it's just the, the linear Stark effect. So if you, um, uh, let me go back to, I think this, this uh, diagram in the top right sort of helps to understand where it comes from. So it's because of that motion um, through a changing mag magnetic field that gives you that electric, motional electric field. Ah, uh -huh. uh, okay, okay. Nice. Uh, yeah, and then because you know that that electric field has to be perpendicular to the magnetic field, you can work out, given the orientation of the uh, emission with respect to E, then you can work out the orientation of magnetic field at that location. Okay, okay, thanks. I see a question from Clara Bogar. Please go ahead. Hey. Hello, thank you for the presentation. I would like to only ask, is this diagnostic going to be sure it's, uh, also with address diagnostic beam based? Uh, Diagnostics, or how to call it, or is the spectrometer separately only for the uh, MSC? Um, so, so uh, I think these, on mass. Sorry, um, on mass we just use the um, conventional MSC system, which doesn't use spec a spectrometer at all. It uses these those photoelastic modulators to and uh, avalanche photodiode, so you measure the intensity modulation of the light over time. Um, because the spectrum on mast, uh, because the magnetic field is 
small, then you can't actually resolve the um, splitting of the spectrum. Um, the shifts, the stark shift on mast is around 0 0.1 nanometers. Um, so you need either an extremely fine resolution spectrometer um, and um, yeah, the, the Doppler broadening is very significant. So it's, it's actually quite difficult to measure the spectrum on mast. So we just use the polarimetry or polarization based diagnostic. I don't see any raised hands so far. So I would like to thank you again for the really interesting presentation. And uh, this is the official uh, end of our uh, webinar.